Welcome back to the channel everyone. Today I want to talk about how the Nasdaq says that the stock market is about to crash. I also want to talk about Mark Cajones' disposition and more. So stay tuned and let's make some money. And now I want to dive straight in with the key information. So, the Nasdaq recently posted an article titled How to Prepare Your Brokerage Account for a Stock Market Crash. The Nasdaq says if you looked at your brokerage account in late September, you may not have liked what you saw. The second half of the month was very volatile, and we may be in for more rockiness as 2021 moves on. While we don't know whether the stock market will experience a full-fledged crash this year, it's always a good idea to prepare for one. Here's a few steps you can take to gear up for an extended downturn. They say step one, make sure you're diversified, like buying AMC as well as buying GameStop, for example. The more diverse your portfolio is, the better equipped you'll be to ride out a stock market crash. If, during a crash, one market sector, say tech, is hit notably hard, you'll be looking at serious losses on screen if 80% of your assets are tech stocks. A better bet is to make sure you own stocks across a wide range of market segments. ETFs or exchange-traded funds, like potentially the new Bitcoin ETF, can help you better diversify. When you buy an ETF, you're effectively buying a bunch of stocks with a single purchase. Step two, they say, is to have plenty of cash on hand for emergencies. Hopefully we'll all have plenty of cash post AMC and GameStop Moats. Here's an important thing to know about stock market crashes. You don't actually lose money if you don't sell during one. Stock values can drop so that your investments are worth less on screen or on paper. But if you hang on to those investments and don't liquidate them, you technically won't lose a dime. And one way to put yourself in a great position to leave your portfolio alone is to have plenty of cash available in savings. You never know when a financial emergency might strike. And if you don't have a decent chunk of cash in the bank, you may be forced to sell off investments to round up the money you need. During a stock market crash, that's the last thing you want to do. So make sure you have a decent emergency fund one with enough money to cover at least three months of essential bills. And number three is suck away some extra cash to invest with. Many people shy away from investing when stocks crash, but actually a market downturn often presents a great buying opportunity, like buying up all of those dips in AMC and GameStop. Imagine you bought a stock for $100 a share that's now just worth $75 a share. That's not great for you. But now, imagine there's a stock you don't own yet that was trading for $100 a share a few weeks ago and is now trading at $75. Suddenly, that decline can work to your advantage. And you could also relate that back to AMC and GameStop as well. Say you bought AMC at $60 or $70, you obviously must have liked AMC at $60 or $70, so why would you not like AMC at $30 or $40? Why would you sell your AMC now? Why wouldn't you be buying more if you liked it at $60 and $70? There's really no way to know when the next stock market crash will happen. Though the market has been volatile recently, things could turn around rapidly. Or not. The Nasdaq say do your best not to worry about a stock market crash, even though that's easier said than done. At the same time, Focus your energy on making the above moves so you can set yourself up to endure a downturn, whether it happens soon or way off in the future. Now, currently, most people don't have a lot of confidence in the stock market. All of these big institutions and market makers have all of these exemptions. There's a massive lack of reporting, and it basically seems like all of the normal rules and regulations that apply to us just don't apply to them. But when investing in cryptocurrency like Bitcoin and Ethereum, it's much more of an even playing field. So I personally use BlockFi to invest in cryptocurrency. And not only can you just invest in cryptocurrency and buy some Bitcoin, but you can also earn interest on your deposits of up to 8.25% per year. BlockFi also offer a rewards credit card with an introductory rate of 3.5% cashback on your purchases paid in crypto. There's also no annual fee on their credit card, but unfortunately it's only available in the US at the moment and not in the UK. And on top of that, when you've generated a large profit on your investment, instead of selling off your Bitcoin and potentially missing out on the next run up, you can take out a crypto back loan with BlockFi to buy yourself something new, like a new car. They have very low interest rates from as low as 4.5% 
per year. So be sure to sign up to Block for using my link down in the description below to get up to $250 of free Bitcoin when you sign up and make your first purchase. Now, not only do we have corrupt politicians like Nancy Pelosi and Jeanette Yellen, but we now also have corrupt judges. Politicians and Fed officials are not the only ones trading in stocks with conflicts of interest. Judges do it too, and a new report shows 131 of them did so illegally. 131 federal judges breached US law by failing to recuse themselves from lawsuits in which they held a financial interest. 61 judges or their families didn't just hold stocks in companies they were overseeing in court. They also traded them during the cases. One judge said that I had no idea that I had an interest in any of these companies in what was a most modest retirement account. The investing world has been rife with conflict recently. Two prominent Federal Reserve officials got embroiled in controversial stock trading, while House Speaker Nancy Pelosi has become popular as the Queen of Stocks, thanks to her own trades and those of her husband. Pelosi made a few stock purchases that could be a conflict of interest as part of her job, while Fed presidents recently said that they would resign over controversially trading stocks while in office. Adding to the issue, more than 130 federal judges violated US law by hearing cases that involve companies in which they or their families held shares. The journal reviewed financial disclosures by about 700 federal judges, filed each year from 2010 through 2018, who revealed holdings in large cap individual stocks and compared them against tens of thousands of court cases. Judges questioned by the Wall Street Journal said they were either unaware of their violations or mistakenly believed they weren't required to recuse themselves from the cases. Now here's an interesting one. Judge Timothy Batten, appointed by former President George Bush, held 11 lawsuits related to JP Morgan in 2010 and 2011, even though he owned shares in the bank. Although, coincidentally, most of these lawsuits led to outcomes in the bank's favour and therefore his stock holdings favour as well. I am mortified, Judge Batten told the Wall Street Journal by phone when he was alerted about the violations. I had no idea that I had an interest in any of these companies. Another judge, also appointed by Bush, traded in stocks including Bank of America, Deutsche, HSBC, JP Morgan and Wells Fargo, while hearing 18 lawsuits that involved one or more of these companies, and overall she heard 54 cases that involved a conflict of interest. During their participation in such cases, about 66% of the rulings were made in favour of personal financial interest. And now I also have some brilliant news for AMC, which is that you can now catch pro football games on our big screen. I think this is absolutely brilliant for AMC. Over the last few months, we've seen them bring more and more professional sports onto the big screen, like UFC and WWE, and now it's gone all the way to pro football. Obviously, American football is the most viewed sport in the US, and therefore, making this change is brilliant for AMC, because it's going to bring more and more sports viewers to their venues. We've also got a tweet from Topic that says over 72,000 call option contracts expired in the money on Friday, while out of the money call options were 261,777. This is bad. Not only a waste of money, but it provides market makers like Citadel with cash as the contracts expire worthless for the buyers. So clearly playing options in this way is not good for AMC and it does not help the mother of all short squeezes. I say it doesn't help in this specific way because obviously if you're buying an options contract that's way out of the money and you don't sell it before expiry and you let it expire worthless, it is obviously bad. But I guess, for example, if you bought an AMC call option contract right here and then sold it in the same hour right here, you would generate yourself a lot of money that you could use to purchase more AMC shares. But on the flip side, it would also be bad to buy an AMC call option contract up here and sell it down here an hour later because obviously you've again just lost money to those market makers. Similarly, it also wouldn't have been good to buy an AMC call option contract up here and let it fall down and let it expire worthless because again, you're just giving money to the hedgies. So if you are going to play options contracts, at least try and make sure that you're buying an option contract when it is low and selling it when it is high, not buying it when it's high 
and then either selling it when it's low or letting it expire worthless. We've also got a quote on AMC and GameStop from Stacey Cunningham, the president of the New York Stock Exchange. She said in some of the meme stocks that we've seen or stocks that have a high level of retail participation, the vast majority of order flow can trade off exchanges, which is problematic, said Stacey Cunningham, president of Intercontinental Exchanges, New York Stock Exchange. That price formation is not really reflective of what supply and demand actually is, she said at a conference hosted by CNBC. Basically, she's saying that the current price of AMC and GameStop is not a true price, as it's not reflective of the current supply and demand. And therefore, if the president of the New York Stock Exchange agrees that dark pool trading is bad and thinks that dark pool trading does not cause a true reflection on the true stock price, then surely it should be banned. Finally, you might know that short seller turned good guy Mark Hodes recently did an interview with Matt Kors where they talked about a lot of stuff to do with the overstock case and Matt also asked him a lot of other questions. During that interview, he mentions his disposition in the overstock case and I've actually found a link to it that I will leave down in the description below. During this disposition, he talks a lot about overstock, obviously, and the naked shorting that went on behind closed doors and was a result of Goldman Sachs. This is a 269 page document, so obviously I'm not gonna read through every single page in this video, but it is definitely well worth a read. It starts getting interesting, probably around page like 45 to 50. Guys, be sure to let me know down in the comments below what you think about the NASDAQ saying the stock market is about to crash. And as always guys, if you enjoyed this video, be sure to check out some of my others. Alternatively, subscribe to the channel and ding that notification bell, because that way you'll be alerted when I upload a new video. Cheers.